right, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar where I am going to be giving a uh, overview on some tips on how I prepare for each trading day. Uh, more specifically, I want to show um, certain areas and pages of briefing.com that I tend to favor and find uh, potential trading opportunities every um, you know every day. Uh, you know, just before I continue, I just want to give a quick sound check just to make sure. Um, say it's hard to hear me, huh? <clears throat> Can hear a news feed in the back. Yeah, this <laughs> it's earnings season, so you definitely get to hear some other analysts talking in the background. So I apologize for that ahead of time. But I'll just, I'll just start speaking up a little louder. Uh, if there is trouble hearing, you know, type in the chat. If you have any questions as the webinar goes on, uh, feel free to type them in the chat as well, and um, I'll do a little Q&A at the end. Hopefully it won't be uh, more than 30 minutes this entire webinar. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so to tell you how I prepare for the trading day, I should probably just give you a quick little background about myself and my style of trading. I've been doing this for uh, over 15 years. I started back in the late 90s on the floor, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange uh, as a specialist clerk. Um, and then I moved over to the Amex and I made markets over there. Eventually, during the, um, the NASDAQ tech bubble, I got a job up, um, up on the order desks and with market makers um, with the NASDAQ stock market. Um, and over the years, you know, I, I kind of became less interested in finding out at, um, the news or the fundamental side of um, why, why stocks were moving. And I found it just way more intriguing to um, focus on how stocks were moving. Um, in other words, I was more interested in, um, you know, why was, why was there a, a buyer at a certain price level? Why was there a seller at a certain price level? Why, why couldn't price get past a resistance area? Why couldn't it break down below a support level? Why was why was everyone paying attention to the 50-day moving averages? You know, I just that seemed to be way more interesting to me than um, you know going through the accounting and the financial statements. Um, you know, and then I took a whole bunch of courses in technical analysis, and over the years I just kind of uh, came up with a methodology which um, you know I tend to focus on day trades. Um, initially, I want to make a fast a dollar or two dollars on a trade, and if it closes in my favor, well I'm going to carry that balance uh, overnight for a swing. Um, you know, in some cases, I'll even carry it for a couple of weeks, as long as the trend and momentum continues in my favor. So, with that said, that's basically just a brief overview of my trading style, and I'm just going to run through, um, you know, certain areas of briefings website, how I prepare for uh, each trading day. Um, I also do trade ETFs as well. Um, you know, I just mentioned down here at the bottom of that PowerPoint, um, but I usually use it mostly as a hedge um, because it's just a broad it's a broad group. I don't. I'm not too particular about shorting individual stocks, just because every time a stock goes down, there seems to be somebody that finds value in it. Uh, whereas ETFs, I've just found to be, um, especially sector ETFs, to be a little bit more as a better trading vehicle for um, shorts against my longs in my portfolio. Um, and also, the the one time that I do actually will trade ETFs on the long side is when an entire group or sector looks like a like a huge buying opportunity. Um, and I, I mentioned ERX down here. Um, ERX was, uh, you know, it's the energy um, sector's bull ETF, triple weighted bull ETF, and you can see it's just been absolutely under pressure the last few months. And when it got really oversold down here around the $50 area, and this had this big volume spike back in December, um, it was just a huge buying opportunity that we put out on, out on the trading service. And uh, we caught a nice 10-point gain there, and then it came back down, retested it for a double bottom with another high volume spike. Uh, for another entry about two weeks ago. Um, so in those cases, you know, I'm more prone to trade ETFs on the long side. Uh, GDX is another example. Um, when it broke out here, you know, above the 50-day moving average, broke, breaking above the trend line, um, you know, that's there's so many stocks to choose from. You know, I look at it, I don't, I'm not smart enough to figure out if I should be going after, uh, you know, NEM or GOLD, RGLD, um, you know, all these other... Uh, you know, individual stocks in the group. So I'm always going to go after the ETF when a massive sector move is underway. Um, let's see. Let's go back to the slideshow. All right, so nightly and morning prep. Um, this is something that just has to be done every day. If you're either a part-time trader or a full-time trader, 
you should be you should be looking at the markets and knowing what's going on. Uh, don't just use our trading service as to blindly follow our coattails uh, and copycat our moves. You're not going to learn anything uh, by doing that, and you're actually probably going to get burned by doing it. You have to have um, a good sense of you know what's going on in the market, understand why the f things are flowing the way they are, and if you can come up with your own uh, scenarios and and pick bigger picture of what's going on, um, you're going to be able to make much wiser decisions and better risk management tools and um, you know, and that's really what we're here for. We're pointing out opportunities for you and giving you a, uh, trying to help you confirm the edge that you see or, uh, you know, just to acknowledge or give you a, not, a potential idea that you're not looking at. Um, and, you know, I got a couple of quotes here. and I'm pretty big on quotes and a lot of analogies. So, uh, but failing to prepare is preparing, preparing to fail by Ben Franklin. Uh, that's a great one. Um, at the same time, you have to basically anticipate everything but expect nothing. You can do, there's nothing more frustrating in this business than saying put an hour or two hours worth of research in and then nothing develops the next day. Nothing develops two days afterwards. Um, you know, something, sometimes it's just not good days to trade. A uh, perfect example could be today. The, I think the Dow, uh, you could be, came in wanting to be a buyer, you know, at a particular level of stock. And of course, the Dow was opening down about 200 points, traded down 375. Uh, in reaction to um, you know negative response to earnings in Microsoft and uh, Procter and Gamble and Intel, um, you know that could just wipe away the entire amount of homework that you did last night. Um, so you kind of have to expect nothing out of the market, although you have to definitely prepare for what can and can't happen. Uh, even the best plans often go awry. That's another great example of what you have to expect in the market. Um, and then I, Bruce Lee, you know, he said it best, and it, it's not just applied to martial arts. Um, it's be like water. Even if you have a set plan to go long that morning, if the market is acting weak and the sector is acting weak and somebody downgrades your stock, you have to basically uh, go with the flow and you might not want to take that long. Um, maybe you want to put a stop order above a certain high or below you know, a certain area or maybe you want to sell puts on it. Um, you, know, you have to kind of just go with the flow. You have to be ready to adjust um, your preparation. But overall, the whole point is just to get a um, establish a not necessarily establish a bias, but it's to really kind of just know what's going on and know what's moving and kind of how to spot potential opportunities. <clears throat> um, so the first thing I usually do, I am a technical analyst, you know, and that is my main function. So I take everything from a technical viewpoint. Uh, I do go from a top-down approach, uh, starting with market breadth and internals, just to get a big picture. Um, I'm going to run through a few of those indicators in a few seconds. Um, I do then look at the major indices, uh, the Dow, the S&P, the, the NASDAQ, the Russell, you know, and I just kind of mark off zones. Um, you know, you can't, in my experience, you, you know, technical analysis is not an exact science. It, to, to, to trade to the exact penny is extremely difficult to do. So you have to basically focus on major zones of resistance, major zones of um, support, uh, congestion areas, and even 50-day moving averages and other moving averages, 200-day moving averages, it, it's rare that you see something bounce off a penny. They're always going to run the stop orders uh, around those areas or below a weekly low, below above a weekly high, and then reverse it. Um, you just kind of have to be aware of these zones as they come in play. Um, sector trends and momentum. Uh, another area, you know, you always want to be focused on relative strength and relative weakness. Those are usually where the best opportunities are as opposed to the ones that are just kind of going sideways and just floating around. Uh, market leaders, uh, briefing has about four proprietary focus lists. Uh, the main one that I focus on is liquid momentum, which is the LQDXX. Um, it's higher price stocks that are showing very strong uh, uptrends, and they usually provide, they have good liquidity and good volatility, um, really good for swing trades and day trades. Um, GrowX is uh, more of a small to mid cap focus list um, on these up-and-coming uh, growth names. And, um, you know, if you're looking for more of uh, that type, they're more of position trading, I'd say, um, as opposed to actual day trading, because um, they are definitely focused on accelerating earnings growth. Um, another area that I pay attention to uh, that I run every night as well is uh, the TA scans, which is a bunch of proprietary um, scans that I use just to get a quick look at the market and potentially find some setups. Um, I do write a swing trader column once, twice a week on my general thoughts about the market or maybe giving a lesson on certain trades. The technical take is one of my coworkers. Um, 
he highlights that every single day um, at, in the afternoon and in the morning, uh, key levels in the S&P and NASDAQ, uh, hourly basis, daily basis, monthly, weekly. Um, very good. Uh, again, if you're looking for major support and resistance zones, that's definitely a nice uh, column to look at as well. Um, and then, you know, the major asset classes. I don't tend to trade them too much, um, but, you know, you have to look at uh, it, what's going on for an intermarket type of relationships that are occurring because, you know, if the dollar's going higher, it's definitely going to have an impact somewhere else on the market. If crude's going lower, you know, you're going to see an impact um, like we've seen in airlines. Airlines have just been absolutely going higher uh, as crude has been tanking the last few months. So, uh, you know, same with bonds. Is it a flight to safety or are they more interested in stocks? You have to kind of have this major... Uh, picture in your head um, to kind of just come up with a scenario to know if you should be focused on the long side or the short side, uh, or should you be uh, reducing your risk or exposure to a certain area. Um, it's all big picture type of things that you have to kind of come up with this uh, this process. All right, um, just to go over quick, I want to show some some of the uh, indicators that I do look at to get market breadth. Um, I've been a member of StockCharts.com for probably 15 years since the late 90s, uh, so it's been my go-to source for, um, you know, doing a lot of research. Um, I know it's kind of a plug for them. I get nothing out of that. Um, but one of my favorite indicators that I like to start with, just check my list here, uh, is the S&P. Uh, it's the number of percentage of stocks, I should say, that are above. And below, above or below their 50-day um, moving average. And if I just make some ch changes here, please bear with me. Let's get rid of this. Let's see how that looks. All right. So this is the S&P 500 stocks. Uh, it's a percentage that are above the 50-day moving average, and a percentage, um, you know, not that above, just the ones that are above. And essentially. Um, when this indicator dips below the $40 area, it usually means that um, the S&P is experiencing some sort of oversold condition and that we start to look for some sort of swing long opportunities, um, which I've noticed just to be, it's just crazy how very helpful this has been um, for identifying uh, you know, potential bottoms in markets. It's not an exact science, again. It's just giving you a broader picture of the conditions. Um, one of the reasons that it's worked so well over the last uh, four or five years is because we have been in a strong uh, bull cycle off the 2009 lows. Um, you have, again, bigger picture. You have to keep in mind we're in a bull cycle for five years now, so any sort of um, shorter term uh, oversold indicators are going to present buying opportunities. It's vice versa. During two, the peak of 2007 to the low of 2009, um, that was about a year and a half of uh, a bear cycle. So it was the exact opposite. This indicator, any time it got overbought, those presented I ideal shorting opportunities. I'm just going to give an example of how I identify um, you know, the bigger picture trends. I tend to look at uh, the New York Stock Exchange advanced decline line. We pulled up initially. Uh, this looks like a mess, and this is uh, just a daily indication. If you're day trading um, or swing trading, this is good to know. You know, extreme readings above 2,000 usually suggest that too many stocks are either um, on the decline or uh, advancing, um, and usually it's a good time to start fading them. Again, it's not an exact science, but it just gives you an indication of overbought and oversold. Um, but for a longer-term bull market, I like their cumulative their cumulative chart. So basically, this takes uh, each day's total. And it adds it up to the prior day, and it gives you this nice long, um, you know, trend of whether you're in some sort of bull cycle or bear cycle. And like I said, off the last five or six years, the 2009 lows, we've had a steady bull cycle on the rise here. Just take up the log scale. Um, nice steady rise here, and you know, this is really nice to see on, say, a um, free IRA or your 401k. If you're trying to time the market on a longer term basis, um, the 50 day moving average in here. Um, you know, I wouldn't panic out of that. You can even you can even get a clearer picture if we go to a weekly chart. <laughs> so this is nice. So we can actually see that the cumulative New York Stock Exchange advanced decline line 
um, hasn't broken below its 50-week uh, moving average, which is essentially you know 52 weeks in a year. This is a good indication. So for me, this is a uh, long-term bull cycle that we uh, have been in and remain in. And it's not until I actually start to see this 52-week average or 50-week average, um, you know, penetrated by this uh, line, that I'm actually going to start sitting there and say, you know what, maybe I should stop giving into my 401k or, um, you know, if I have long-term investments in my IRA or something, I might start taking a more bearish approach or just moving more of my portfolio to cash. Um, it just gives a really good heads up. Um, I'll just go back to say like 10 or 11 years, and you can see what happened in 2007. So it's at late 2007, it actually started to dip below that. And it, had you heeded that advice to go to cash or be more bearish, you would have uh, avoided a nice uh, big correction. You know, and it also worked right here coming up off the 2003 lows as well. Just something to look at. Um, bigger picture, you know, and that and with bigger picture in mind, I'm going to go back and say, you know, shorter term oversold indicators uh, actually work pretty well. Uh, other indicators I just kind of glance at. Uh, would be a uh, put call ratio, uh, this not on the cumulative basis, um, just more on the daily basis. Um, again, I'm looking for extreme readings here. You can see anything popping over 150 suggests there's too much uh, put buying in the market at the end of December there, uh, which means that um, you know you probably get some sort of rally into your end of sorts. Um, down here, it just says there's too much call buying, and uh, you might want to go opposite direction. So it's more of a sentiment indicator. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange, um, it's, uh, NYMO, I think. This is the uh, the McClellan Oscillator, um, and not to get into too much of the uh, details here, but it takes the spread between a 39 moving at 39 period moving average and a uh, 19 period moving average, um, and it puts it over advanced decliners in the market, and it does a pretty good job. So basically, when that spread widens. It's telling you that um, it's almost you're almost going to get like a snapback in the market, whether it's up to, whether it's too, the prices are too high or prices are too low. You're going to get a it's a mean it's a reversion to the mean type of indicator. Um, you know, and obviously you can kind of eyeball this and say every time um, we get a uh, dip below 40 or 50, you know, the market becomes oversold, and any time it comes up uh, above 50 or above 70, we're in an overbought state. And again, this is not an exact science. You can't just go short the next day or go long the next day because you see an extreme reading. You have to wait for those uh, reversal bars on your screen um, you know, to jump in and uh, find opportunity. But it helps you uh, just better time the market on a shorter term basis. Um, I also look at the, uh, the NASDAQ McClellan oscillator, um, which again, hits extremes below 50, 60, 40 area. I'm starting to look a little bit on the buy side, maybe scale in on some longs. And vice versa, if it gets above uh, 40, 50 on the high side, um, I trying to look for shorts in weaker in weaker trends. Um, you know, maybe pulling back in a downtrend or something like that. Uh, that's pretty much the sentiment indicators I look at. I don't, I don't go into statistical stuff like that. Um, I just again, I'm just trying to establish a bigger picture. I want to know where we are going into the next morning. Um, you know, right now we've been around zero for the last two days in this. Uh, NASDAQ McClellan oscillator, and as well as the other indicators, and you know it makes perfect sense in my mind because it's earnings season, and we know there's going to be stocks that gap up, and we know there's going to be stocks that gap down, um, and right now the market is kind of in uh, just no man's land. Um, you know, if we just kind of look at the S&P itself, again, if you have a charting software that um, you know obviously you can draw on and write on, I know it can get very sloppy, but it's um, it's, it's crucial that you do do that. Um, but right now, uh, if we look at the 60-minute 60, uh, 60 time frame on the S&P, and you look at just the January range itself from here down to this low, we're sitting right in the middle of that range. So there's really uh, not too much to do in this market um, on an intraday basis. Um, for me, I, I like to look at more of the extreme readings in the market to uh, create some sort of swing. When I'm in the middle of the markets, it's definitely more of a scalpers, day traders market, people reacting to the news, reacting to the headlines. Uh, once you start moving to extremes and you're coming into other support levels and other resistance levels, that's usually where I like to step in and take um, either my shorts and my ETFs or, um, you know, or longs in certain sectors and certain stocks that are setting up nicely. Back <clears throat> um, to the slides. 
So again, uh, major indices. That those are the, those are the breadth indicators and the turtles that I look at. Uh, the major indices. Um, again, I just kind of mark them off, like I just kind of showed you in the S and T. Make little notes on the side. Um, I do. Speaking of making notes, uh, I can't recommend enough what it uh, means to keep a trading journal. If you definitely need to go out and buy yourself a marble notebook or a spiral notebook, and dedicate one page a day to uh, you know doing your prep, um, whether it's what I just showed you with the internals, or whether it's whatever you like to trade, um, whatever looks good to you, just write it down. Um, you know, I know it's uh, this day, this day and age of like paperless society. Um, get yourself a notebook with some paper and write it down. Um, you know, or, or a spreadsheet if that's what you prefer. Uh, you need to keep track of this stuff. And there's nothing better than on a weekend if you can just take the notes that you wrote down for the last week. And spend literally 10 minutes on your on your commute, either to commute home on a Friday or uh, just 10 minutes on a Sunday night to just review what you wrote down and to look at those opportunities again. Um, that's really going to help you um, just establish your bias. It, it might even tell you that you were wrong, completely way off on what you were thinking. Um, again, it's going to be, um, you know, this is a constant practice where you you're you have to admit that you're wrong at times, and you know, but you also have to pay attention to what does work in certain environments. And the only way you're really going to remember that is if you write it down on paper and most importantly have the discipline to just spend the five, ten minutes reviewing what you actually wrote down. Um, I mean, and I, I don't recommend doing post-its and, uh, you know, papers that are, can be loose just because uh, I've been there, done that. Uh, I still am guilty of having post-its and stuff, um, but they tend to get scattered or misplaced or just, um, it just it looks like a big mess. Stay organized. Uh, get yourself a notebook. It, it's going to do absolute wonders for your trading. Um, that's it. I'll just move on. Uh, so sectors, you know, again, real simple stuff here. I, I don't go crazy in my nightly and morning preparation. Um, you know, and just to throw in something too, uh, everyone has busy schedules and lives, whether you're single or married or have kids or whatever. Um, you know, for me, it's mostly my preparation. I do a little bit at night. And then I, you know, try to reinforce some of the stuff in the morning pre-market when I come in. Um, it, I don't spend three, four hours uh, in a, just staring at charts all night long. Uh, it just doesn't fit my lifestyle at all. Um, and, you know, some people that I might work for, uh, for me, if I spend more than 30, 45 minutes uh, looking at a chart or a whole sector or something like that, I'm going to be prone to analysis paralysis. Um, my bottom line is either it's there or it's not, and I'm looking for the next opportunity. Um, so you can see on this screen right here, I have most of the major, I have the major uh, nine S&P sectors, and I threw in a few uh, more hot ones recently, um, you know, like the biotechs, obviously, and it's just real simple stuff. I, just looking at this grid here, I know that biotechs are hot. They're breaking out. They're going into the highs. That's where all the best opportunities are going to be. Uh, same with some drug stocks over here. Um, transports, I know crude's going lower. They're trying to make a recovery off this low here. And they're coming into some resistance, potentially could break out. Um, utilities have been really strong. I don't trade them too much because they're kind of slow moving, but I definitely know that they've been outperforming. Um, I should have REITs in here somewhere. I, I know REITs were, uh, REITs, I've been long REITs for two or three months now, and I know they're really strong. Uh, this is a concern for me. You know, I see staples, they broke out, and then they come in hard. Something like technology, this is a concern as well. It bumps up against the January resistance comes back into the January lows on a hard gap. Um, just stuff like that. Um, maybe it's a buying opportunity. Uh, maybe it's not. You just got to have to be aware of what's going on. Industrials, we know Caterpillar got hit, um, you know, coming back off this resistance level. This is mid-range for energy, but you have a double bottom going there, which we picked up. So again, um, you know, just kind of broad market analysis here. I don't tend to trade these um, particularly because they're a little bit slow moving and you have to take uh, significant size in order to make those percentage gains. Um, but I'll, knowing that they're at a particular support or resistance level, uh, it's just at least going to give me a heads up that I should be looking at a particular stock. Um, so like, for example, uh, energy stocks. Oh, eh, that's a bad one. But, um, oh, well, energy stocks, I could have said that. Um, but I would have been looking down here. I was looking at so many of them uh, that were just looking so oversold uh, that I did eventually just go with the ERX as a long down there. Um, but that's just a general picture. Now, you don't, if you don't have a software like this, you know, you're just going to have to go back to something like a stockcharts.com or whatever uh, internet service that you use and literally just type in the symbol and look at it. 
Uh, generally speaking, I like to see, um, you know, I like to go with the trend of the 50-day moving average, which is this red line, and the trend of the 20-day moving average. Um, if you're starting out, I can't emphasize that enough. You have to always trade with trend. You shouldn't be taking longs down here um, or sh um, trying to pick bottoms at all, um, unless you've, you know, have a well, unless you have a you know, grown your account and you definitely know what you're doing and you know how to manage your money and your risk. Um, because I can guarantee you if you try picking lows, um, you're just going to get stopped out. Definitely have to know what you're doing to go counter trend. Um, one of the easiest ways to trade is with the trend or have the wind at your back. Um, but yeah, if you just have a, you know, a no utilities, you know, nice uptrend. And this is just simple stuff. It just takes literally three seconds to go through. Right now, industrials, I don't like this chart. It's going sideways in the range here. I, I'm not going to really be trading industrials. It's just not, uh, this doesn't look pretty for me. Um, I know airlines have been doing uh, really well. I believe it's uh, XAL is what I wanted. Um, you know, and you should be getting accustomed to the ticker symbols and everything. So airlines, nice strong uptrend. Anytime they pull back to this area here, you want to be looking to go long, um, you know, uh, down to here. So I'm going to just start going through the charts. I could have went last week. I was looking at uh, LUV on this pullback here. It went below the 50-day. I knew earnings were coming up this week. I tried to take a long in it around 39, uh, and I got scared out of the position down here around 38 um, as crude started to pop a little bit. I should have stuck with it, or at least I should have jumped back in when it got above the 50, um, but I was already moving on to the next opportunity. Um, but it is definitely something you just have to look at. UAL would have been a better bet for me. Um, should not again. I should not have done um, long a stock that was below the 50-day moving average. I should have stayed with this one. Uh, I would have had much more success. DAL, eh, that was all right. Um, JetBlue would have been a nice one to pick up off the 50-day moving average around 14. Uh, ALK has been really strong. Um, you know, this is definitely one. It's actually on one of our leaders' lists, I believe. Um, I should have been all over this one, um, but just something about buying airlines. I don't know. I've, I don't know. I have to think I'm <laughs> something about them. They, they seem uh, like tough, tr tough vehicles to trade, from my experience. Um, anyway, so that's basically just giving you a quick, uh, you know, uh, look technically of what I try to look for. Um, market leaders. That's another area um, that I want to focus on. So in, in play, uh, under investing and trading. This technical analysis area, this is just a, a no-brainer for me. I'm always looking at this area. I basically write two of, out of the three pages here, so I'm just, it's just something that I'm always looking at. Um, a nice little glitch going on here. Um, but I highlight a few names that are amongst our top leading stocks in the market. Um, you know, And the key thing I want to get out of here is for these leading names, um, I want to definitely look at the industries that they're in. I want to definitely, because um, that's going to tell you where the relative strength is in the market and where the best opportunities, buying opportunities are. Um, biotechnology, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, technology, semiconductors, uh, you know, semiconductors. I see a REIT in there. I see a pharma, biotech, biotech, home furnishing, home furnishing hotels, uh, some apparel, you know, just quickly glancing through your pharmaceutical, medical supplies. I mean, if you haven't figured out already that you should be long something in the healthcare industry, uh, then you're not trading properly. You know, um, that's where the bull market is. You should probably be long some sort of semiconductor as well. Um, you know, maybe if you're looking for a REIT, you should be owning that. Um, you know, and you just have to look at it, these charts real quick. And, you know, I'll look at the REITs quick. These are REITs, uh, really strong uptrends. Uh, semiconductors probably took a hit today on Intel's earnings, um, but you know names like Texas Instruments seem to have held up pretty well. Um, and the other group obviously would be biotech. You know, nice strong uptrends. You want to be focused on the long side on these types of names. Uh, real simple stuff. And again, I'm just kind of glancing at the names here, just trying to get them. You know, take a visual, like almost like a um, snapshot in my head, just to be aware of them. Um, th again, this is preparation stuff. This isn't actually like stuff that I do during the day. I just want to look at these names and just become somewhat familiar with them and familiar with the industries that they're in. <clears throat> Back to the slideshow. Uh, the next thing I do is the TA scans. All right. Again, this is the initial, um, you know, I'm always taking a look just to get a bigger picture in my mind. 
uh, here are the TA scans for today. Again, these are the proprietary scans uh, that I came up with probably 10 years ago. And they're real basic stuff, shallow pullbacks on low, um, in uptrends, uh, minor corrections and uh, pullbacks and downtrends, um, the liquid momentum focus list, any stocks that have an RSI below the 50 midpoint. I'm interested in those because those are strong stocks that are essentially pulling back. Um, stocks that ran up for three days or more, uh, inside days, doji days, stocks that are overbought you know, compared to their five-day range. Um, these are usually good breakout candidates or breakdown candidates. These are actual breakout and breakdown candidates above like resistance levels, whereas these are more like uptrending stocks or downtrending stocks. Tight consolidation, stocks that haven't been doing anything for the last few weeks, um, you know, potentially can move. Um, and then you have just your typical moving averages. You have lower price stocks that are showing strong momentum. Um, I, I nicknamed them zippers, and they're just really, uh, you know, five, ten dollar stocks, price stocks that are just kind of ripping higher. Um, usually some sort of news or headline. Um, if you actually go through some of these, you're going to see a lot of them are stemming from um, these are small cap um, biotech names or um, small cap um, uh, REITs or semiconductors. Just so happens to be the groups that are showing relative strength. Um, and bang for your buck, um, you know, these are just high, uh, I guess high octane stocks, I would call them. Uh, they have really wide trading ranges. Um, you know, and there's definitely a lot of volume and liquidity there. And if you're just looking to scalp or day trade stocks, uh, this is definitely an area you want to look at. These names are the ones you want to look at because um, they're just going to move probably two, two to three points in a given day. Um, and, you know, most of all, I definitely came up with this scan a while back. Um, it's just a momentum tracker based upon weekly and daily signals in the SPY. And it's either going to be red, uh, yellow, or green. And it's just telling you what the current momentum is in the SPY. And it's been on a yellow signal probably for about two weeks now. And that kind of just says, all right, again, it plays into the bigger picture. Um, we came, we had a weak January, we bounced, and now earnings season is coming up. And if, so it's not a surprise that this is going to be a sideways or flat market where buyers and sellers are going to be battling for control and pushing certain groups in certain directions. Um, so with that in mind, I usually tend to, you know, cut back my trading, either, either my size or the amount of trades I'm going to take, and I just kind of be a little bit more looser with my stops, and I'm just not as being aggressive. Um, you know, when it's in a green upward trend, I'm going to be trading full size, more aggressive on the long side. When it's red, obviously, you know, more aggressive on the downside. Um, you know, one thing I also do, too, is that when it does go from green to yellow, I start putting on more of those uh, ETF shorts you know, in certain sectors, um, whether it be uh, retail or uh, fine, in, internet or technology, um, you know, because it just tells me that the, the upward momentum is slowing down and I need to start putting some shorts uh, in my portfolio, um, you know, or I can just go long something like a, um, one of the things I did on the service was I went long the SPXU, which is a Contra um, S&P ETF, right? I think we went yellow, uh, from green to yellow right here at the end of December. And we picked it up on this day here around $37, $38. Um, you know, we caught a really nice initial pop for $5 gain um, into early January. Um, and I, you know, I sold out most of it there, but I'm just holding a small piece of it now as a small hedge to, uh, you know, the longs that I have, some of the longs that I have in my portfolio. Um, again, that's, it's a nice little signal, but it also tells you uh, where to focus. If I see this as yellow and the market itself know is back here near the uh, near its January lows and that we're in a yellow sideways market well I can feel a little bit confident maybe stepping in and buying some weakness a week ago here after a five-day run-up I've been advocating more of a um, not I hate to say bearish tone but more of expecting a pullback um, or consolidation to develop as this week started and, and to last Friday um, I wasn't really doing anything last Friday I don't think I placed a single trade um, just because I knew we were in this yellow sideways range the last few weeks based upon momentum, we're coming to resistance area, um, and I'm just going to hesitate and just I'd rather sit back and wait for a better opportunity. And that's, again, this is where, um, you know, doing this nightly prep and this morning prep, especially with the internals and the indices you just and the trends and the momentum, you just going to have to get a feel uh, for whether you should be involved or whether you should not be involved. And um, you get to see whether you should, um, you know, is this, 
you know, the market, there's always an opportunity. It almost, it's the, the, it's, they're flashing money in your face constantly. Um, so, you know, you almost want to be involved all the time. And that's a mistake. You almost, you're much better off uh, just picking and choosing your entries. Uh, you know, two great examples would be uh, a baseball player. You know, they go to batting practice. They, um, you know, they spend hours before a game just swinging and hitting the ball, hitting the ball. And when it comes game time and they're up against, you know, and up against the pitcher, and they might not swing at anything. They might just get walked. Or they're going to swing at everything that comes with them because they're nervous and they didn't prepare properly and they're not focused and they're going to strike out. You know, and, you know, to use a different example, if you're not a sports person, um, let's talk about gambling with blackjack. Um, you know, blackjack, everyone knows the basic rules of uh, playing 21. However, if you play every hand, you wind up, you're going to wind up just losing. The house always wins. They have the advantage on you. Um, but there are little, there are certain um, basic rules like, uh, you know, hit, hit on a 12 if a dealer's showing, you know, if the dealer's showing a 13 or 14 and you have an eighth, you know, you need to hit that. Uh, you know, there's basic strategy rules that you need to be aware of. Uh, if you're card counting, you know, and you're paying attention to the number of picture cards that are coming out, um, you know, and you're keeping track of that in your head, you're definitely going to give yourself a much better edge to, so when you see an opportunity, you're going to jump on it and you're going to bet bigger. Um, so it's really kind of the same exact thing here. Just because you do your nightly and morning homework, as I noted earlier, the most frustrating thing in the world is to do all this work and then come into the market the next day and just sit on your hands. It's probably the hardest thing to do too. Um, but it's probably the most important. So you really kind of have to take that into stride. And, and that, that takes a lot of practice and a lot of years of losing money, um, you know, just figure out how to do things properly the right way. Um, all right, we'll move on here because I don't want to take up too, many, too much time for everybody. Uh, I do look at some of the fundamentals, um, but I do look at them real quick. And really what I'm looking for is I go through the earnings calendar. I go through upgrades and downgrades. I go through... Um, economic events that are coming up, uh, glance at IPOs. I'm not a big IPO trader, um, I, basically because there's no chart information for me to trade off of. Um, I'd much rather see an IPO uh, you know, a week or two or maybe even a month after the fact and then revisit it and try to find uh, better levels of interest to trade. Um, but it's just something that I want to be aware of um, just to look at in case the name looks interesting. Uh, page one is really interesting too. It's a nice summary of uh, what's been going on overnight or what's going on for that week that you just pay attention to. Um, you know, of course, um, you know, I divide the dual in play page on briefing. Um, it's probably one of the more ingenious things that they've come up with um, because you can filter a lot of these uh, comments. So this is this takes up a monitor on my screen all day long. And on the left side, I have uh, all headlines essentially all the news, the options, uh, you know, economic data, anything I want to see, it's basically all fundamental data here on the left. And then on the right side, um, I pretty much have all technical analysis, all trading calls. Um, and I don't know how I would live without this. I mean, this is a, just a key thing that I look at all day long. Um, you know, like I said, fundamental on the left, technical on the right. It's the best of both worlds. And I just can't ask for anything better than that. Uh, I highly recommend you come up with your own filtering device of how you want to establish that because it's really uh, a great way to view our service that we offer. <clears throat> um, if you are new to the service, you know, definitely don't ignore the view custom tickers right, right here. This is going to be uh, just a nice introduction to what all the tickers on our website mean. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory. Everything seems, for the most part has an X after it just for, for whatever reason, programming reasons. Uh, but if you're interested in all the trading calls um, from a trading service, these are all of our uh, our handles that we use, our nicknames. Um, but if you're interested in more specific, uh, you know, researching certain areas, every page has their own um, ticker. Every uh, scan has their own. Every trading uh, methodology has their own, et cetera. Um, so just don't you know take a, make sure you get familiar with those uh, tickers as well. Uh, if you're new to that. Um, earnings calendar upgrades again. I'll just go real quick of what I how I look at it. Again, I'm not a fundamental person, but I do look at this stuff. Uh, calendars, earnings results. Go here. I go to what's going on this week. We have a big earnings week this week, so it might just take a little longer than usual to load up. 
There we go. Uh, and then I just I glance right down here in the symbol column just to say, all right, what's coming up? So we have already done Tuesday, but after the close today, and I'm looking, I see Amgen, I see Apple. Um, you know, it's quick glance stuff. If I don't recognize a symbol, um, you know, and I, I guess the other point I should make is, um, you know, I just went through the TA scans page, and I went through the leaders of liquid momentum, the uh, technicals that look good. So any of those symbols that just jump out, I know, like, obviously, uh, Yahoo jump out and U.S. Steel jump out, those uh, the, the big major market cap ones. But I'm also looking for uh, any names from that liquid momentum focus list or any names that were on those scans that I went through that might just kind of jump out at me um, you know, as reporting earnings. And it's a quick glance. If I don't know the stock or the company, uh, I'm really just not going to even pay attention to it. It's just one of those things that I look at. Um, so I'll zip through those. Um, obviously, earnings season, you're going to have a heck of a lot more to go through uh, than, say, in March. We have nothing. Um, upgrades and downgrades, again, there's going to be a lot more during earnings season. Um, but I usually like to see, um, again, bigger picture type of things. Are there more upgrades or more, are there more downgrades going on? And as of right now, I mean, this is interesting. Um, you know, there's probably about 15 upgrades here and about 30 downgrades. Um, just something to keep in mind. Maybe I want to, and then if I really want to go back later on, I'll look to see what stocks, uh, stocks those, sec what sector those stocks are in, uh, just to see how, you know, Wall Street is, uh, you know, weighting certain portfolios, et cetera. Just something to look at. Uh, economic data, I, I don't pay attention to this at all, to be honest with you. I'm just not smart enough, nor do I care. Uh, the key thing that I look over here is the time. Uh, I want to know when this data is actually coming out each day. To me, that's way more important. Last thing I want to do is be putting on an energy trade uh, at 1025, you know, on a Wednesday morning, right before inventory data comes out and everything could spike. Uh, against me. Same thing, uh, Fed talk tomorrow, 2 o'clock Eastern. I'm not putting a trade on probably anywhere between, you know, 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock, 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock at all. Uh, I probably won't even trade after the fact for that matter. Things are too crazy. Um, you know, but you just want to kind of look here. I, I know pending home sales. Again, I'm not touching housing stocks uh, Thursday, the first half hour Thursday morning, or uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or anything associated with Whirlpool. Um, natural gas inventory. Just, just trying to look for these times that things are coming out. This is 9:45. Um, you know, just so you are not getting caught up in the uh, heightened volatility, leaning the wrong way in the market. Um, I'd much rather just avoid those time frames for trading. Um, you know, there's plenty more stuff here that you can look at. Again, the IPO one is here if you're interested. Um, they're always covering the IPOs that come out here. If you want more details on the IPOs that, um, that our analysts like, uh, the next big thing is usually a pretty good place to go as well. Um, I see Shake Shack is coming, uh, you know, uh, making its debut soon. Um, that's one of the bigger ones that seems to just jump out at me. Again, I probably won't trade it the day of, and probably just wait to see how things play out after a week or two before I actually look at it again. Um, and that's pretty much my nightly review or my morning review of how I, um, you know, look at everything. Once I get in the morning and it's the last, uh, uh, say, the last 15 minutes, 20 minutes before the market opens, um, I'll just look at some of these tickers. This is a summary. This is a, a daily wrap. Uh, this is what's on the wires. Um, this is the scan, which is going to tell you what's um, gapping up and gapping down. And then uh, OPTN, you know, I look at it at night usually uh, or in the morning. It's uh, option activity um, just to see where – there's no real, it doesn't really say if anything's um, super strong or super weak. Um, it just tells you where the uh, implied volatility has been increasing or de decreasing. Um, so a quick look at, um, just to give a quick example, I would just say ScanX here. It would pull up the archives. And I usually just go into a headline mode. And I can just see today's biggest gainers and losers. The ETFs are trading at 52-week highs and lows. Notable movers of interest are always interesting during the day. Uh, but pre-market stuff, I got early pre-market gappers, gapping up, gapping down, um, just stuff like that. You know, if I want to just know what's going on in the market um, when I wake up or right beforehand, um, you know, RAPEX and SummerX usually give some sort of global view of what's been going on. Here's a closing summary. Um, here's a midday summary, opening market summary. Um, Again, it just tells you what reported, the big ones that are hitting, taking the Dow down we saw today, um, durable goods orders. It's just a nice summary of everything that I kind of looked at. 
I'm just kind of being made aware of. And uh, to be honest with you, that's really how, um, again, you're just trying to establish, uh, <clears throat> you know, get aware, make yourself aware of what's going on in the market with your preparation. Um, you know, that's the, this is the, all the initial thing. Once you find stocks that you like and sectors you like, well, then it's all about going into the actual charts and finding key levels and stuff like that. And I'm, that's not what this webinar is about. This webinar is about um, just a getting, just doing your homework that you need to just kind of have a feel for. Pretty much it shouldn't take you, um, you know, I'd say minimum 30 minutes, no more than an hour to do what I just showed you and kind of br just briefly look at this stuff. Um, you know, I tend to split it up uh, based upon my lifestyle and the schedule in the afternoon. And plus I watch the market all day long, so uh, I, I already kind of know what's going on. Um, but again, I write all this stuff down in a notebook. Uh, I'm always kind of looking at it. Notebook or the journal is going to be a key guide. Um, you know, when it comes to specifically trading, um, especially newer traders, I, I don't think people have realistic goals of what to expect uh, from our service or even just their own returns. Um, so I came up with this uh, table a couple of years ago called the Profitunity Table. It's it, um, you know, your opportunity for profit. Um, and I, I, I have a copy of it printed out, and, and I put it inside that notebook. And I just kind of look at it, and it just kind of tells you how, you know, what is your goal for the year? What do you need to accomplish? And how much do you really need to be making on a monthly basis or a weekly basis? Um, granted, every day is not going to be, you know, a profitable day. However, um, you know, are you hanging around too long in a trade trying to make something when you've already made your, uh, you know, the quarter that you need to reach your goal? You know, uh, you know, you only to make twenty four thousand dollars a year. You only need to make a hundred dollars a day. So if you're already up, like say three hundred, four hundred dollars on a trade, you know, you've pretty much just made your whole entire week. Uh, so you should be locking in profits, you know, and not hanging around. You should be lock. You know, you, you kind of have to keep everything in check and keep coming. I come back to this at least on a weekly basis just to make sure that I'm in line with my goals of what I'm trying to achieve. Um, you know, it's simple math, but when, like I said earlier, when, when the dollar signs are flashing in front of you, um, you know, you can get really uh, just caught up in the moment and the emotions take over and you have to re kind of just refocus. Um, and this is just a table that you can just uh, make up, a, make up your on your own uh, or just copy this somehow. Um, just kind of keep looking back at it, at it and understand, uh, you know, how much do you really need to be trading? Uh, you know, size-wise, or how many, how often do you need to be trading to really kind of reach uh, those goals that you that you need? Um, what you also should be doing, you know, in lieu of just a notebook that keeps track of, um, you know, just pre preparation of stocks that you like or sectors that you like or just general trends or something, um, you should be keeping track of every trade that you place. Um, whether it's in a spread, I prefer a spreadsheet. Um, I know your brokerage statement keeps track track of this as well as well, but um, what I like to do, um, you know, and you can set this up any way you like. It's just, a, you know, an example of how um, you can do it. I've changed over the years, obviously, um, you know, to cater how I like to see things, um, the way you take partial profits, et cetera. Um, the key thing here is that I like to put the notes. Why did I take the trade? Uh, did I like us? It's due for a bounce after getting hit into the uh, month end, or it's at a, here's my stops, or it's uh Still bouncing, et cetera. It's at a 50-day moving average. I took a partial profit here. Um, it's, a, it's a holiday post Thanksgiving correction in retail. Just a thought process, you know, just putting it down on the, uh, you know, just putting it out there. So when you go back and review your trades, you know, at, at the end of the day or at the end of the week, you can go back and see why you made a mistake or why you didn't make a mistake in a certain area. Um, again, just something that you should be keeping track of. Um, and this is another thing. I saw this on a website uh, a couple of years back. Um, basically, just took a calendar and they put their P&L in it. Um, and I thought it was brilliant in the way it was just to keep track of your performance. Um, you know, I know I know some people suggest actually graphing it out on a chart so you could see what your account grow. Um, but I thought this was more ingenious to put it on a calendar. Um, so for like January, uh, you know, you plug in the dates and you start with the opening balance. Um, you can put in goals for the week if you want, but you put in your actual gain or loss or your realized P&L, um, and then you have your ending balance for each day. And you have then you total up, and it shows it what your total was for the week. Um, and then you start the new week, and you go through. If you do this for one month, this this is such a wealth of information. 
uh, and a look into your own trading personality and your own money management, uh, this would give you so much insight of where your problems are, where your weaknesses are, and where your strengths are, and where you need to improve. Um, even the just totaling up whether you made more money on Mondays and Tuesdays and lost midweek, um, that could be pretty significant. So tell yourself that, all right, it's midweek, and um, for some reason, maybe you have a Tuesday night bowling league or something like that, and you just don't do well on Wednesday mornings. Um, it could be something as simple as that. You just get to recognize and see where your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, you know, maybe it's mid-month is your uh, weakest point, or the be or beginning of the month. You know, maybe you just don't do well. Uh, I know for me, I'm way more active come end of month and beginning of month than I am mid-month. Um, it's just the way I trade. It's just the way uh, my logic works, and it's the way I see setups. Um, you know, it's just a really nice, good uh, way to keep track of your own performance. Um, you know, trading is almost like a, uh, a psychoanalysis of yourself. You have to kind of really know who you are, what fits your comfort style, um, what type of trader you are, and, you know, especially on what days are best for you or what months are best for you, what time of the week is best for you. Um, this is a really good way to anal analyze your performance. Uh, if you can make some sort just you don't need to do a spreadsheet like this, but just get a calendar and just write in your profit and loss. Just keep track of the totals on that calendar itself. Um, and I'm, I'm, I guarantee you do this for a month and you look back. Uh, I would love to hear back on an email, um, you know, saying how it helped you recognize some of your problems and fix some of the stuff that you um, had issues with. Uh, that's pretty much it. I want to wrap this up uh, before it gets it's getting a little bit too long. Um, but again, the, the whole key to this whole thing in summary is, um, you know, do your you have to do some sort of homework. Don't just blindly go into the market and say, hey, there's a bullish reversal breakout here. I'm buying it. Uh, you got to know what is going on in the market. It just, uh, I know it sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised how, um, you know, you have to be aware of certain groups and certain sectors and what's going on bigger picture. Um, you know, trading is not just some fly by the night get quick get quick rich scheme. Um, it's uh, it becomes a job. It becomes an obsession. So it's like running a business. You have to know the uh, ins and outs. Now, do you have to know every fine-tuned detail to make money? No. Do you have to have a general sense of uh, where the advantages are and strengths and weaknesses? Definitely. Um, so you, it's just this constant uh, moving parts uh, beast that's always like the bolt, the snowballing and snowballing, rolling and rolling. Um, you know, and I, I just can't recommend, uh, you know, suggest enough that you have to just kind of keep on top of this stuff and keep track of it. Um, this is the way that I approach the market, and you know, it does. I do pretty well in uh, finding opportunities um, and trading these stocks, and you know, focusing on zones. And then at the same time, um, it's really helped me to step back and say, you know what, I don't like anything in the market today, or I don't like anything in the market this week. I don't like the environment, um, or I'll just cut back on trading as a whole. Um, you, again, it's this whole big uh, analysis of self. And trying to see fit to see what fits into your your type of wheelhouse. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, I want to thank everyone who did stay stick around. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, hopefully, you got something out of this. I mean, if you walk away with one thing, um, hopefully, you got some value out of that. And uh, this will be recorded. Um, I will go through Q and A real quick. I don't want to spend too much time. I'm not looking at any individual names or giving any uh, advice out. Again, this is not about chart analysis or techniques. This is really just about getting your head straight and approaching the market each day with a picture in your mind. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm just going through some Q&A here. Um, I'm, I'm, it says, how long do I typically hold a position? You know, I am a swing trader. Um, you know, I, uh, that's my nature, swing trading. A day trade. Essentially, if it if it if it trades not winning, if I don't, if I enter a trade and I, I'm losing money on it by the end of the day, I'll just close it out. Um, you know, I, I don't have the patience. I don't like to worry about positions um, too much. At, at the same time, if I, if if I like a certain zone in the stock, like um, for example, I was really liking um, you know, like I said, the energy stocks with the um, ERX. Um, actually, you know, I can go back to uh, Goldman Sachs. I took a long in Goldman Sachs. Someone asked a question about that. Um, so I took a long in Goldman Sachs uh, just after earnings. I think it gapped down here on this day, I want to say it was. And 
as the zone itself, 175, uh, 173. I based it off the October lows here. I believe the 200-day uh, moving averages were also here um, right around this vicinity. I can't remember where. Uh, I took them off uh, earlier for some other reason. Um, but this whole zone down here was interesting to me. Um, I didn't go in full size just because I um, – you know, the stock's in a massive downtrend. The market was correcting. Um, it's it's a counter trend up, counter trend um, trading opportunity. Um, but I felt like all the news was priced in at that point that it was just overdue for some sort of oversold bounce. And uh, I wound up just scaling into a position around 174. And I think I added a little bit 175 on the way up. Um, you know, and then the next morning it opened higher, took some off, and then trailed, and then took some off. I think my target was just uh, December low here in the gap, took a, most of the position off here, and now I'm holding my small 50, 50 shares uh, with a stop around break even 174. Um, so again, it was just kind of this bigger picture taken to context type of thing. Here's the XLF. I knew it was oversold. JP Morgan reported earnings two days prior. Um, you know, Goldman Sachs reported. It got knocked down. It just seemed like it was due for a, a big reversal, so I started jumping back into it. Uh, that's counter trend. Uh, you know, again, it takes a long time to master counter trend. The much easier play would have just been to stick with the trend and short here at the 50-day moving average around 190 and just ride it down for a much bigger gain. Um, you know, and you could have saw that in the XLF as well as this was underperforming. Um, I didn't take the short, but I think we were highlighting this as a bad signal here um, as the group was getting hit back to where the 50-day moving average is on the service. Um, so that's just one way to look at stuff. Uh, trim and trail, that's a great uh, analogy. Um, that's that's pretty, pretty much how I uh, swing trade. You know, I, I day trade for the initial profit just to kind of put money in the bank. Um, but then once it starts working in my favor and it's moving the next day in my favor, uh, I'll maybe take a little bit more off. And then otherwise I'll just, you know, put the stop at break even or around that area and trail it and just try to see how long I can hold it on to. Um, yes, everything's going to be recorded. Um, and it's also going to be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, can you have access to the spreadsheet? Um, sure. Uh, you can email me at swingtrader at briefing.com, and I'll see if I can uh, send that link out to you. Uh, where do you find ScanX? ScanX is actually just a ticker, um, so you just can just put it into the archives, and um, you know, or you can just go to the main page and just type it up here. It says ScanX. Um, and it's it's going to show you all the movers for the day, the gapping up and gapping down. Uh, can I talk a little bit about stop management as a trade process? Uh, as, as a trade progress. Um, I, I use a lot of mental stops. I'm not a I'm not a big size trader, so I definitely like to, um, you know, I don't really necessarily need to, uh, you know, put hard stops in. Uh, I always felt like that was for. Um, you know, people that are trading massive amounts of size and taking bigger risks than they should. Um, I never try to trade more than, a, you know, above a certain risk level. You know, I definitely like to get a good night's sleep. So uh, I also think a lot of stocks need wiggle room, so I don't put my stops at usually anywhere where I know they're going to get hit or stopped out in a certain area. Um, you know, I definitely have a harder stop further away, but then I'm a big fan of alerts, e-signal software. You know, I'm constantly setting alerts. I must have thousand alerts go off you know each day and I'm constantly just looking at price levels and just you know setting alerts for my software um, as opposed to putting actual uh, stops in um, once the stock moves in my favor and if I'm long a stock and it's above a moving average I'm just kind of keeping track and setting alerts around the moving average um, but I'll always have a hard stop in probably around break even after I've taken a lot off um, uh, how do you decide which trades make the most sense from your TA scans list, overbought versus oversold? Um, if you go to the TA scans page, I, I, I want to wrap up the webinar here. But if you go to the TA scans page, uh, I've done webinars specifically for uh, the TA scans um, and how to best utilize that. There's, um, there's examples right, right here on this link here, and there's also webinars on how each one of these patterns and you know, how to incorporate just glancing at this, how to get a good feel for overbought and oversold um, uh, sector trends, et cetera. Um, and I think uh, that pretty much is going to be the end of Q&A here. Um, 
Again, if you have any questions, you can email me at swingtrader.com, uh, swingtrader at briefing.com. Um, if you have any questions about the trading service, um, you know, please contact us, the sales department, at sales at briefing.com, and they can uh, tell you all about the contracts. Uh, and the diff they can also give you a little bit more depth into the different uh, pages and services that are offered. Um, so, again, thank you very much for uh, showing up. Hopefully you all got something out of it. And enjoy your evening. Thank you.